It's my honor to present now Gerald Broy. Good morning. Fun trip today, isn't it? I left New Hampshire at 6 o'clock, got here at quarter of 10. So there probably are people who are planning to come who are still trying to get here. So, But uh, at any rate, um, I'm glad to see you all. And that's a southern expression, by the way. And I'm uh, hoping that you will get to see the exhibit if you haven't already. But I think what you're going to learn this morning will probably help you enjoy the exhibit. But be before we even talk about the exhibit, um, what I want to talk about is cloth. And because it, what we're going to be looking at basically is made of cloth. And yet cloth is something that we seem to really take for granted at this particular time in our lives and in this particular time in history. But if you can think back at a time when cloth wasn't available, except when you made it yourself, just think about how different the world would be today. Just think about the importance of cloth in terms of our, our security, our safety, our comfort. I would suspect that, for instance, in this particular situation, things might be a great deal different if there wasn't cloth. I perhaps wouldn't feel as comfortable as I do standing in front of you, addressing you. <laughs> so I, I think we have to look at the history of cloth begin, before we begin to realize uh, the importance of cloth being used as, as self-expression, which of course is partially what quilts are. Unfortunately, the word quilt sometimes uh, brings connotations to people's minds that aren't necessarily what you're going to see in the exhibit today. Uh, there were very many reasons for making quilts, and we're not going to focus on the reasons for making quilts because they were so varied. But you have to understand that quilts were made to celebrate just, the, just about every milestone in people's lives. And as a quilt collector, I began, Paul and I began collecting in 1969. And we didn't know anything about quilts when we first started collecting. We looked at them primarily as we looked at any other art form. And as a result of that, we didn't particularly know about the history. We didn't know about the technique. We didn't know um, anything other than the fact that they were beautiful. And the, the fact that they were practical in a sense, because you could fold them up and take them with you. So it was like portable art. Also, the scale of quilts themselves lend themselves to walls, regardless of whether they were made for beds or not. But just changing their positions from horizontal to vertical makes an enormous difference in how quilts uh, appear. And we had a rule that nothing was purchased for the collection without it being held up and without us getting 20 paces away. And as a result of that, most of the quilts that you're going to see in this exhibition represent the, the type of quilt that we were interested in and the type of quilt that we collected. And they were collected primarily because we considered them art. It's taken a long time for cloth to be considered art for many major institutions. Perhaps because it's so vulnerable, perhaps because it, it is uh, organic, perhaps because it deteriorates, or perhaps that cloth is so associated with nothing more than utility. But even within utility, I make my quilts as fast as I can so my children won't freeze, and as beautiful as I can so my heart won't break. That's what quilt making is all about, and that's what quilt making was about, especially in the 19th century, for women ha who had no other means of expressing their artistic natures except through cloth. That statement comes from a woman who lived on a, in a Saudi. You know what a Saudi is? OK, in the plains of Nebraska, there's no trees. There's no wood to, deal, to build with. And as a result of that, they built with sod. And sod is nothing more than the top foot 
layer of prairie that is grass and roots. And they constructed these little shelters called Saudis. That in itself uh, has a great deal to do with what quilts have become to mean to, to both Paul and I. But as we began to collect quilts and as we began to become interested in the history of quilt making as well, which is a great part of it, uh, it, it gave an uh, added incentive for us to constantly look at the collection and to reevaluate it as we went along. And as we reevaluated it, we began to see that there was so many different aspects of quilts and quilt making that could be collected. But it was our aim to collect primarily through our own interests because there were other people doing the rest of it. Museums, historical societies are full of beautiful quilts. We didn't necessarily collect beautiful quilts. We didn't necessarily uh, collect applique quilts, for instance, because they tend to be very, very pretty and not opposed to being pretty, but somehow applique quilts because they're birds and flowers and whatever. You, you recognize the image before you get involved with the color. So pat patchwork was much more our kind of thing to collect because they were abstract to begin with. They were the kinds of things that lent itself lent themselves to just the practical way of cutting cutting fabrics into shapes, putting them back together in either orderly fashion or whatever way the particular individual wanted to do. So this morning what I'm going to do is kind of parallel what was happening in the 19th century with the fine arts by comparison to what was happening to uh, quilting in the 19th century. So what I'm going to do is start with the recognizable image and talk about that and talk about eventually the loss of the um, recognizable image and where quilt quilters were perhaps dealing with that, those concepts uh, 100 years before the formal art world actually uh, lost the image and, and was totally involved in just abstract expressionism. So we will start with what is a Pilgrim Roy? <laughs> and people who don't know that, hear the word, often say, well, what is a Pilgrim Roy? A Pilgrim Roy is a Paul Pilgrim and a Gerald Roy. <laughs> and Paul Kurt Pilgrim is on the left. A, a, a funny story, about a year after Paul died, um, a woman from the Midwest who was organizing a quilt conference called the office and was talking to me and she clear she she wanted Paul to come and do lectures uh, teach and um, so she, she was clearly not either aware that he had passed away or who she was talking to so she said are you the tall dark handsome one or are you the other one <laughs> well I'm the other one Okay, first of all, what is a quilt? It's not a quilt until it's quilted. Now, a quilt is three layers. It's like a sandwich. There's a top, which is the fun part, because that's the artistic decorative part. There's a middle, which is the batting, and then there's a back. And what holds it together is basting stitches first off to keep the three layers from moving. And then the quilting is applied. Now the quilting is applied for a function, for a reason. And that is to keep the batting stable so that it doesn't move when the quilt is used or when the quilt is washed. Now the batting can be very decorative or it can be merely um, utilitarian. Depends upon, again, the maker. Lots and lots of choices there. As many choices in the quilting as there are in the, the piecing or the applique. And the techniques that are involved are very limited. Not as limited as to today as they used to be, because the industry has changed considerably with a lot of technological improvements. But however, this is the way traditional quilts are made. They're made by piecing, which is actually cutting geometric shapes and piecing them together. And piecing them together accurately because a mistake that's made in one block, if it's consistently made, is going to show up in the long run to be a disaster because the, the quilt is not going to go together 
be sewn together accurately. So these are very, some of the very simple geometric patterns. And as you begin to, to become more proficient, remember little girls started quilting, or uh, started sewing, when they could hold a needle. And as a result of that, sewing was a very important part of the household because cloth had to be manipulated in order to be, to, be, to be functional, regardless of whether it was for household use or clothing. So sewing was very important. And as a result of that, little girls might start with the upper left-hand corner, which is a, just a simple little four-patch. Then as, as they became more proficient, they started doing much more complicated, pieced blocks. Now these blocks are the elements that are put together in a quilt Example, the lower left. The blocks are put together, and that, again, has a great many choices. They can be put together, butted right up against one another, square. They could be turned on point, which is meaning putting them at an angle. You can then decide if you want cloth in between the blocks, which is called a sashing. You can then decide whether you want the sashing to have corner blocks. So it goes on and on and on with a tremendous variety of... Uh, decisions that have to be made with each step. Or applique. Applique is as simple as the word means. It's applying cloth on top of other cloth. And in order to do this, you cut your shapes. There's a certain amount of freedom with applique that doesn't come with the piece uh, technique. So you cut your shapes, you lie them on top of another piece of cloth, and then you needle turn. You actually go in with the needle, turn each tiny little segment as you go, and then do, use a blind stitch, probably every 30 second of an inch, in order to get good, smooth curves. And then there's a combination of pieced work and applique work, which is what these are. The baskets are pieced, the handles are applique. Most of your curves, of course, are done by hand, except today there are machine uh, ways of, of doing curves. But in each case, you're getting more and more complex with regards to not only the technique, but the visuals. And then you come up to the early uh, 20th century, last part of the 19th, early 20th century, and you come up with something like this, which is called a crazy quilt. And each of these uh, were not necessarily done by quilters, but because of the Industrial Revolution and because of the additional wealth that, that created an enormous middle class, people had time to decorate and to do things for their homes. And no home was considered complete. No home was considered fashionable without a crazy quilt. Technically, they aren't quilts because most of them are not quilted. They don't have that quilting thread that joins the three layers together. But they were called quilts anyway. Um, and they were not necessarily used for warmth or for bed. They were used as covers for uh, sofas, for chairs, for tables, or hung. They were, they were the first of the art quilt that existed because they had no no purpose other than the fact of being beautiful. And the, um, the difference between these and the other quilts is the fact that they are also what is called foundation pieced. In other words, the, the cloth is cut into shape. It is applied and sewn to a foundation, which is another piece of cloth. And then the seams are decorated with fancy stitches. Uh, I often think the seams are decorated with fancy stitches to probably hide the fact that they're not very good sewing to begin with. But at any rate, they're highly adorned with all kinds of different stitches, different kinds of um, embroidery. Sometimes there's even stuff attached to them. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about how and why we see color the way we do. And here's that old color wheel. People are so tired of the color wheel. But the color wheel has so much information that if you don't understand it, you need to understand it, because it's really important in terms of your work. It takes an awful lot of guesswork out of uh, making choices with regards to, to cloth and fabric. 
The hue, for instance, in this particular wheel, this, this is a wheel that I created with a line of colors that I did uh, in 1994 for PNB Textiles. At that time, I was teaching interaction of color, and I would have to go to lots of different manufacturers in order to come up with the solid colors that I needed. In order to deal with color, in order to deal with color in a, purely, uh, in a pure way, prints don't work because prints interfere with color activity. And as a result of that, I taught with primarily using just plain cloth. But I had to go to many different manufacturers in order to come up with an accurate color wheel or accurate, accurate spectrum of colors for people to, to work with because I was teaching a lot of the Joseph Albers theories. And as a result of that, we needed clear, we needed pure colors. So this color wheel was what the result of five years of working with PMB Textiles in order to create this line of fabrics that was called um, uh, color, the color spectrum. In this particular wheel, the center contains the hues. Now that's a color like uh, you would get, for instance, if you bought a, uh, a tube of paint before you added anything to it. It's the strongest degree, the purest form of that color that exists. And of course, you've, you know what your primaries, your secondaries, your intermediate colors are. The center of this wheel represents the hues plus exactly the same amount of white added to each. So it was scientifically produced. So that in each spoke of that color wheel, the colors are equal intensities because they have the equal amount of whatever has been added to them. So the light refractive quality of each of those colors in the center of the wheel, in the middle of the wheel, and the outer edge of the wheel, which, which, are, uh, which is made up of, of the hue again, but the opposite color on the color wheel added to it to dull it. Now, the minute you add something to a color, either white or its complement, you dull the light refractive quality of it. And this is all done scientifically, and it was all done mathematically, so that in each particular case, the same amount of each was added. This will give you just a tiny, tiny fraction of an idea of how and why there are so many colors uh, that we are able to distinguish, because this, in a very, very short way, will, will introduce you to just how many colors, for instance, that lie between these colors. Look at the yellow and look at the yellow green. Well, that's mixed by using equal quantities. However, in order to get there, if you varied the quantities, of course, it would vary the amount of uh, the, vary the, in, the intensity of that color and would vary the quality of the color. It would vary how it appeared. Each of, this, each of these colors has a complement, which is opposite on the color wheel. So you can begin to see how complex uh, color can be. And it's why when you walk into a paint store and you look at a wall of paint colors, you're sort of overwhelmed because just the choices uh, are just phenomenal. The outer rim of the colors uh, has, is the hue plus the complementary color added. The middle is the hue, which is the purest, and the center is your color that's had white added to it, which is called a tint. So you have your tints, your hues, and your shades. Now the difference between how traditional colorists use color and how interaction of color differs, and what is, and this is important with regards to what you're going to see in the quilts, is that we traditionally were taught as children to use dark, medium, and light. In other words, to use the wedge, each of those wedges has a light, a medium, and a dark. What interaction of color says is that you use brights with brights, dulls with dulls, and darks with darks. So instead of using the wedge, you're going around and you're using either tints or shades or hues together. And the reason you're doing that is that you're avoiding contrast. And by avoiding contrast, you come up with interaction of color. You actually come up with an ability for the colors to interact, to give, to take, to have conversations with one another. Because you're eliminating the fact that they are stopped by contrast. 
This was the, uh, the entire line of, of fabrics that were available at the time. And um, what we did was we, in order to produce solid colors, because they didn't sell very well, we also had to produce a line of prints that went along with it. And this quilt is made of all of the solids and all of the, the prints that went along with it. But it shows you what interaction of color is. There's no contrast within any of the blocks. The only contrast that is apparent here is through gradations of color, so that you can go through from dark to light, but within each unit itself, it eliminates color. It eliminates color contrast. It eliminates black and white. Black and white stops color interaction. Not that black and white is evil or bad. It's just that if you're going to use black and white, you have to arrive at the black and at the white by going through a series of steps that guides the eye into that. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is talk about a little bit what was going on in the art world uh, with regards to uh, placing the recognizable image and the abstract image with regards to the art world, the recognizable image, and the, what was going on with quilts. And we're going to start with realism. I'm classically trained as a painter. So I know how to create that false illusion of three dimension on a two dimensional surface. And I still find it fun to do. Um, this is one of my paintings. I'm only going to show you works of mine because I can talk about them because I know how and why they created. But I also don't have to worry about copyrights in, in, in presenting them in, in lectures like this. So in order to create that false illusion uh, of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. I know, for instance, that I have to uh, create that space by using sort of a formula. And that formula is, even though the colors in the foreground and the colors in the background appear, you know that they're different. You know that they're the same, but, but you don't paint what you know. You paint what you, you don't paint what you see, you paint what you know. And as a result of that, trees in the foreground and trees in the background, even though they, in reality, are the same color, you can't paint them the same color. Because what happens is that that contradicts the space. It contradicts the, the ability for you to present a three-dimensional, the appearance of a three-dimensional surface on a two-dimensional surface. And as a result of that, you arrange all your strong contrast in the foreground. And as you go back into the background, then you reduce everything. You reduce it in intensity and you reduce it in contrast. Black and white is only discernible up close. And as you go back, even though you know that shadow is just as dark two miles away, you can't paint it that way or you're confusing the viewer. So even in rendering sky colors, for instance, because you want that sky to appear as a dome, you want it to appear so that it's, when it's above your head, it appears above your head, and as it goes back to the horizon, it is going to have to appear lighter, so that, again, so that you don't contradict the space. But no matter how you manipulate the recognizable image, it's still a recognizable image, and you relate to that first. It's a cloud, it's a mountain, it's a tree, it's a bird, it's a person, whatever. But it's also a color. But recognizing it as an image first is what you come to. Color is always secondary. Color is merely to either decorate or to create that false illusion of three-dimensional space. Now, no matter how you, again, manipulate contrast, if you use contrast in anything other than the foreground, you have to then do something I'm sorry, did I say that right? Yes, if you use contrast anywhere except in the foreground, then you have to do something to counteract that. And in manipulating a dark, for instance, in the background or in, in the distance, then you have to contrast that by using much, much stronger color, more intense colors, where the viewer would initially start to look at this as a three-dimensional surface. So therefore, the colors on the ground have to be much brighter, have to be much stronger, have to be much more intense, and the colors of the sky, 
again, in order to create that false illusion. Now, even with Impressionism, with, uh, with, with actually destroying that three-dimensional image and being much more personal with your adaptation, much more personal with your coloration, even with that, if the image is there, the viewer is going to immediately associate with the recognizable image and not the color except through uh, decoration. Okay, we're going to do non-objective, traditional, and non-traditional. And we're going to start with a totally abstract work. Now, when this came on the screen, you can no longer identify with the, with the recognizable object because there aren't any recognizable objects there. So what does it immediately come to your mind? It comes to mind with regards to its color. Well, it's a, it's a yellow shape or it's a purple shape but no longer can you associate this with what you normally bring to, uh, to, a, to an, an, an experience. This is exactly what was going on with quilts and quilt making. When you learn about the color spectrum, you also learn that we see color depending upon the ability for that color to register in our minds. And the reason colors have an opportunity to register in our minds is how much light they give off. When you close your eyes, there's no color. When you open your eyes, it's only light that brings that message to your brain through your optic nerve, through your eyes, that tells you what color you're looking at. Each one of them has an ability to register to, to, a, to a certain degree. And white has the strongest degree of right refractive quality. Yellow, if you look at the color wheel again and squint down on it, yellow remains con constant in your vision, more so than all the others. Well, that actually proves, too, that light, the light refractive quality of yellow is the greatest of all the color in the spectrum. In this particular quilt, uh, this particular quilter understood that and used the two colors together. Uh, this quilt is actually in the exhibit and uh, is used to, to actually show that particular point. Now, when you squint down on this, for instance, both the white and the yellow tend to fade at the same degree, and that's because there is that uh, same degree of light intensity. No accident that she used this on the back. What is the complement of yellow? It's purple. So this particular maker clearly understood what she was doing when she created this quilt. Three colors, three choices, but all the right ones and all the right intensity. We began to realize, as we looked more and more at quilts, that lots and lots of similar kind of experiences like this began to happen. And we began to realize that the 19th century quilter may not have been aware of color theory, may not have even been aware of the arrangement of the color wheel, but they knew it when they saw it, and they recognized it, and they used it. It was intuitive. Now this is as close as I could find in my 50 years of collecting uh, of a purely um, complementary composition with regards to this particular pattern. And this particular pattern is called orange peel, or it's sometimes referred to as robbing Peter to pay Paul, um, because you use the pieces that you cut, you use them as well. But this still forms what is called a vibration today. And a vibration is equal intensities of hues put together, touching one another, creates such a strong uh, phenomenon with the eyes that the eye can't focus on the area that they actually touch or merge. So it creates a little tiny vibration. And vibration is going to be one of the it's the first category that you're going to see in the exhibit. The exhibit is set up with eight different categories of different color activities, different color theories. And so this particular show uh, is the first time quilts have ever been exhibited in this way. And it's important for you to, to know how the 
how the show was organized in order for you to get the greatest amount out of it. Now this is a contemporary version of that traditional pattern. This again is the orange peel, but it's done in a much more non-traditional way. Well, we'll go back. And this is the type of thing that Paul and I looked for when we looked for quilts. We looked at those types of quilts that an individual would have done by using a traditional pattern, but making it their own. This is another version of a contemporary quilt done today using the traditional techniques, but using interaction of color, using colors that related to one another, using much more free form rather than the traditional pieced or applique forms. It's why quilting is as, is as important today as it has always been, because it's been able to blend, it's been able to change, it's been able to alter itself and renew itself for each generation of people who have become involved in it and wanted to become involved in it. Now what happens with interaction of color, the difference between it and in comparison to that false illusion of three dimension on a two dimensional surface, is that's a stage that remains static. In other words, the players on that stage, the mountains, the trees, or whatever, they don't change their positions. They remain static within that particular scene. What happens with interaction of color is color no longer has a specific position within a composition. And because they're equal in intensity, they're playing darks with darks, dulls with dulls, lights with lights. They have, to, they have the ability to change in your vision. As you glance across a, a composition like this, for instance, some of the colors appear to be in front of others. Then the next time you glance at it, they change, they alter, and the space is continually moving. The word to describe that is plastic. So this is a plastic space. It's an ever-moving, ever-changing space with regards to the static space of the recognizable image. Now there are many, many choices, many, many different opportunities you have of creating that. Again, it depends upon the individual and it also depends upon the materials that are available. And the one thing about patchwork that's interesting to, to constantly keep in your mind is that it depends upon the, the materials that were available at the time, what people had to work with. Um, colors and textiles change with regards to fashion, and they change often because we want to continually make sure that you keep buying new clothes and you keep staying fashionable, and the same thing happens because what happens with cloth is that it's leftover cloth that is used for quilt making. Not any longer, people go out and buy fabric to cut it up and put back together again. But in the 19th century, uh, or earlier, most of the fabric that was used in cloth were pieces of cloth that were left over from, from uh, utility, left over from other sewing projects. As a result of that, the early 1900s gives us this kind of color because we were sick of all the dark colors from the Victorian era, so the 20s, after the war, for instance, after the wars, uh, people wanted light, they wanted bright, they wanted happy things, they didn't want depressing colors anymore. And as a result of that, these kinds of quilts begin to emerge, uh, or at least the ability to, to do quilts of this type. But here's, here's an example of an individual who did their own thing. Now again, uh, possibly criticized for not using a, in a strong degree of contrast, like this for instance. But again, it's the same image. It's what's called a barn, a barn raising image. That is a square that's, that is, gets larger and larger and larger. And here again is the more traditional way of putting that together. However, this is a huge scale. By and large, it's much, much bigger than what you're normally gonna find in most traditional 
log cabin barn raising quilts. There's an area next in the exhibition called variations. And that variation will show you a particular pattern and then show you how a series of individuals changed that pattern and did their own thing with it. So with interaction of color, here's the traditional use. This is something we're all comfortable with uh, because it goes from light to medium to dark and they totally separate. There's no problems there. Here is interaction of color, non-traditional, where there is no or very little contrast. And as you can see, with this kind of of color relationships, the colors have the ability to work with one another. They have the ability to affect one another. They have the ability to act upon one another, to give, to take, and to cause what interaction actually means, the ability for colors to interact with one another. Sometimes their appearance has changed. Sometimes there's the appearance of a third color that's created by two colors coming together because the eye is going to visually mix them. Complements or equal values and intensities can produce color vibrations. And as you see here, the color vibration was really taken advantage by the advertising industry when it was discovered. Because it's the kind of thing that's going to draw your attention, but it's also the kind of thing that's going to repel you. And a lot of fast food restaurants, for instance, uh, used this kind of thing to attract people. But they wanted to get you in and get you out. So. They used uh, color vibrations in order to do that. Now, purple and green are transitional colors. When I say that, they're the only two colors in the color spectrum that are made up of a warm and a cool. So therefore, they are transitional. They're a way of bridging the gap between warm colors and cool colors. So they're, they're extremely valuable in, in terms of their usefulness as far as uh, colorists and people who are working with color. Um, one of the problems that I've had over the years in dealing with people and working with interaction of color and teaching color and, is the fact that um, color prejudice enters into it. And I often hear, well, I don't like purple or I don't like orange, or oh, I don't use this, or I don't use that. Well, that's one of the silliest things I've ever heard. You know, think of a pianist cutting a section out of a keyboard because they don't like the sound that it creates, or removing a couple strings here and there from musical instruments. Why would you limit your, your work box, so to speak? Why would you limit your tools? And as a result of that, um, color prejudice is something we've learned. We don't like orange. We don't like orange. You don't like orange. I like orange. Um, it, but usually when I ask people, what's their favorite color? It's blue. What's your least favorite color? It's orange. They happen to be compliments. <laughs> How can you use one without the other? Um, so purple and green can be, can be very, very, very helpful. But also, there is that um, common knowledge and theory that cool colors re will recede and warm colors will project forward. And the proof of that is if you take a cool color and you reduce it to a small piece in a composition, it's going to lose its integrity. It's going to lose its ability to hold its own color-wise. Whereas if you take a warm color and you cut it into a small, small piece, it's going to still be able to maintain its identity. It's because it has a stronger light refractive quality. There's a pattern called a lo the log cabin pattern where the center of the pattern is, the center of the block is a square. It's a very small square. The rest of the pieces get bigger as you go to the outside of the block. There's an old wives tale that says the center square represents the hearth in the home and therefore it should be red. Well, that's a nice way of saying that if you don't use red, chances are your composition isn't going to work, or the composition isn't going to be as successful because anything other than red is going to fade out in that one particular uh, application. 
Well, that was enough for Paul and I to go and find all of the log chemicals we could get our hands on that didn't have red centers. <laughs> and those you will see in the show as well. There is a place for traditional quilts in the exhibition. And the placement of the traditional quilts is in the middle of the exhibition because that's how Paul and I started collecting. When we first started collecting, we knew nothing about quilts. We knew nothing about the technique. We knew nothing about the reasons, the purposes quilts were made. But as we learned and as we reevaluated the collection, we began to realize we wanted the collection not only to reflect our interests. Collections are only as interesting as the people that put them together. Collections are, should be put together for a particular reason, and that is perhaps to change existing views, to change existing ideas, to give people an opportunity to look at something and perhaps change their way of looking at something and experiencing something. That's the value, I think, in people who are seriously putting collections together. Collections should also have a purpose. They, there, there are collections of quilts and then there are quilt collections. You know, a collection of quilts is nothing more than a bunch of quilts that you happen to put together that you like. A, a serious collection are collections of those that, that, that have a purpose, that have a reason, and that can be used to, to benefit others as well as the collectors themselves. So when we started looking at the collection, we started re we reevaluated it on a regular basis. And we began to realize that, as we learned, it was very important not only for the collection to reflect our particular interests and perhaps quilts that were overlooked by others, other collectors, other museums, other uh, organizations, but also we wanted the collection to reflect the continuum of quilt making in the country, in the United States, in America, which meant we had to look for, contempor we had to look for traditional quilts, which employ white. White stops interaction. And as a result of that, it wasn't of particular interest in ours until we started realizing that there must be traditional quilts where white is just as important to color as, uh, in, in, as in interaction of quilts. So the quilts we started collecting were those that we felt that the white areas themselves were an integral part of the design. So I'm gonna go through a few of those. This is a Baltimore Brides quilt that happens to be in the collection. It took me many, many years. It took us many years. In fact, it was after Paul died that I found this, that I was in, even interested in including a Baltimore bride quilt. Because to our way of thinking, they were so cluttered, they were so busy, they were so, um, so much that, that we didn't have a particular interest in them. And it wasn't until I, that this one came to my attention that I was interested in it. Because it breathes. It has an opportunity to, to let the white come through and be part of, integral part of the, the quilt itself. Many of the Baltimore quilts were, were the products of uh, wealthy people ordering or choosing blocks that they put together. And they, would, they were put together usually for brides or they were put together for for different purposes, but at any rate, you could go in, you could choose a block that you wanted, and chances are you, cho you chose the best blocks, the prettiest blocks, the ones that had the most stuff going on, and then put them all together. Well, as a result of them, some of, the, some, some of them are so heavy, some of them are so cumbersome to look at, that you really can't look at it for what it's composed of, but you look at it uh, on the whole, and they begin to look like one begins to look like the other after, after a while. And when this quilt came, this is such subtle arrangements, for instance, it's a, it's a nine block center medallion, and it's surrounded by red and white, primarily red and white. The, the blocks, each block is designed and well executed. This was done for um, Georgiana Eltonhead, whose father was a very successful, wealthy jeweler in um, Baltimore. And it was commissioned by three Riley, the three Riley girls, a mother, a daughter, and a niece. And each of the blocks is, there's a Georgiana Eltonhead block that's signed and dated, 1854. And there's also a block signed by each of the makers. And it is pretty, but it goes a little bit further than just being pretty. Here again, is another, what we call masterpiece quilts. 
Many of these quilts exhibit a tremendous amount of, of skill, dexterity, planning, um, and this is no exception. Here's a detail. And this goes to prove that not all quilts were made to be used. These quilts have been handed down, were treasured, and were considered heirlooms when they were made. This is probably uh, one of the finest examples of all the quilts that were made by that individual. Um, this was not anybody's first quilt. In fact, I would doubt that anything you're going to see in the exhibit was, was anyone's first quilt. You know, it's just like, it's just like um, dancers, it's just like musicians, uh, any, other, any other art form. It takes practice and it takes a great deal of time, effort, and ingenuity to, to actually be able to perfect whatever it is that you're using for your personal self-expression. And cloth and fabric is no exception. Quilts were made for many, many purposes. This, for instance, uh, was made by a woman for her son to take to the Civil War. This is Christian A. Fisher, 18, uh, 1862, I believe. And right there, it has Christian A. Fisher and the date. But in the quilting, it has the Lord's Prayer. And it's in good condition. So therefore, we can be assured that Christian came back from the war. So there's many, many reasons quilts are made. This would be a good example of what we tried to find and what we looked for when we started realizing that we needed um, applique quilts in the collection. This is a very traditional applique uh, rose wreath done in the 1930s, 1940s. Beautifully made, beautifully quilted. Then we found this. This goes a little bit further in introducing the background as more of an integral part of the quilt itself rather than just being a background for the applique to lie upon. And this takes it even one step further where the background because, becomes such an important element within the quilt itself. But you see still how difficult it is to look at applique quilts because you're still looking at flowers first and you're not necessarily looking at color. One of the first quilts you're gonna be in the, see in the exhibit is this wonderful log cabin uh, quilt and it's in the vibration section. And it really is going to take looking at it carefully because the center of each one of these blocks contains a beautiful use of a pure hue of orange and a pure, pure hue, hue of blue, which is complementary. It's also going to set red and greens together, which, are not a, which again are complementary, but they also form a vibration. And here you can see how quilt making, the quilt patterns themselves will add an addition, an additional element to the, to the block itself. Rather than just utility quilting, you'll see this, you'll see many, many patterns. But remember, they initially were create, quilting initially stabilizes the batting that was used. But the minute it was discovered, the minute it was discovered that it could also become uh, a visual as well as uh, practical, then people started using very beautiful, designing beautiful motifs to do this. Here, for instance, is the kind of thing that we would look for. We would look for things that didn't necessarily have strong contrast, but the things that would have uh, close, close values. And here again was one of the quilts that we bought specifically because the person who owned it was really anxious to get rid of it for two different reasons. First of all, the blocks weren't separate, weren't separated with contrast, so there was no real order established by it. And second of all, that it employed so much orange. And of course, we were thrilled by it. But many, many quilts that we bought, um, we found that people were really glad to get rid of. This is called Joseph's Coat, and it's a perfect example of one of the Joseph Albers um, color theories that employs, 
Jennifer? What's the word? Gradations, sorry. Had a mental blank there. Gradations. When you are going to use contrast, you go through a series of steps to guide the eye into it. So that when you use dark and when you use light, you have those steps that occur in order to, to create the interaction of color. One of the next you're going to see is optical illusions. Actually, quilts that employ the repetition geometric pattern and the color usage so that the eye has the ability to borrow and take from different aspects, different areas of the quilt, and actually join them together so that as you glance across the quilt, it begins to fracture and you begin to see multiple images. Here's another example of that sort of thing. Okay, now it's up to you. I've come to the end of my talk, and now it's up to you to ask questions. So can we put the house lights up a little bit? There we go. That's just to stimulate you a little bit. Okay. So I have a microphone here. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. I had a wonderful opportunity yesterday to talk to um, the groups that are going to be um, taking people around and giving, giving gallery talks. And it was an interesting exercise because an awful lot of people asked questions that made much more sense with regards to the questions that that they're going to be asked, the docents, I mean. So don't be afraid. Um, the yellow and white quilt, the basket quilt, um, that you showed earlier, mm -hmm. um, on the screen here, it looked like it was all white, white, all yellow, the same white, the same yellow. It is. Yet, yet down in the gallery, it's, it does not. And I, was that the lighting? Or it looks like they're, you know, I know that white comes in many different shades. I mean, it looks like there's almost gray well, that pieces. Actually, was that, that on purpose? No, or that just... actually has to do with the material it's made out of. It's okay. made out of sateen. Okay. And the sateen weave is not a straight weave. And as a result of that, as the fabric changes, it catches the light differently. Yeah. Okay. But it Thank is, you. it's all the same fabric. I'm curious about the fabrics used for the quilts. I know crazy, crazy quilts can include velvets and all, a variety of fabrics. Are these essentially pure cotton? These are cottons and wools. Cottons and wools. Yeah, and silk. And then the thread count might vary to create the sateen versus a more matte finish. Yes, yes. Yeah, thread count, uh, quality of goods changes with regards to our economic conditions. So cloth, the, the quality of the cloth will change depending upon what's going on in our economy. And the quality of the cloth also changes with regards to a lot of different factors. Fashion being one of them. Color being another. A density of color, for instance. The, the cloth will change and will, will deteriorate much more rapidly depending upon, say, a particular color that's used on it. Yep. I've seen the show and it really amazed me. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, when the quilts are not at a show, are they in your home? <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> wow. But they're not, they're not visible. No. The best place for quilts is in museums. Why? Because they're protected. They're not only protected uh, when, they're, when they're sleeping, but they're protecting when they're awake. No, um, chances are if I had to do this all over again, I, I might think of doing coins instead. <laughs> Being a little ignorant to begin with, didn't, we didn't realize the obligation that there is in taking care of textiles. They're the hardest thing in the world to, tech, to, 
to take care of. First of all, cloth likes to be flat. They also like the same conditions we do. They don't like to be too hot. They don't like to be too cool. They don't like to be too damp. They don't like to be too dry. So, uh, and they don't like to be in strong light. And that's one of the things that I, when I do gallery talks, when people enter that gallery, I say, we're gonna talk for a while so that your light, so that your eyes will acclimate to the kind of light. Because it's, a cer it's only a certain strength or candle light that we can expose quilts to without them being affected by the light. It's also why most of the galleries and museums have glass doors, because they're in um, atmospherically correct uh, situations. So that gallery has the right humidity, the right lighting, the right temperature. And as people come and go, too, it changes it. So the atmosphere is constantly being tested and constantly being kept up to, to museum standards. Uh, when the quilts are at home, they're either flat or they're in acid-free boxes, but there's no way that they, that they are exposed to light. Um, and they take up much, much more space than I do. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, thank you so much for this incredible collection. I went through on Sunday. Just um, You're welcome. Incredible. My pleasure. Um, but it, I have a couple of things. Um, well, first of all, I have family names, which are both Gingrich and Deal, so I think I own a couple of those quilts down there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but remember, possession is nine-tenths right, of the Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's more on, on the workmanship. I'm, I'm amazed, I guess, that the quilters who wouldn't have had formal educations were able to, to figure out the geometry of putting the things together, plus the actual um, quilting, like the, the, the Irish chain and the other background quilting. How did they create, I mean, did they actually have sort of a pattern to follow, were they? Oh yeah, yeah. There were patterns to follow that they would trace. But I'm glad you mentioned, you know, the ability to put something like that together. Look at the scale of these things. Look at just the ability to handle a surface that big. And look at the ability, uh, and look at how long it probably took in order for, for people to gain that kind of skill. You know, they originally, little, little girls originally started making doll quilts and crib quilts because they emulated the mother making big quilts. And as a result of that, you know, the skill was gained and the, squ the skill level was gained according to, to uh, practice and, and continued effort. But... The same people that you see, the same anonymous people that you see represented in those quilts in the, in the gallery, or quilts in general, those same people would be your doctors, your lawyers, and your CEOs today. Because it takes not only the skill, but it takes a great deal of knowledge, of mathematics, of geometry, uh, of engineering, of architecture, to put those things together. We sort of take it for granted because they're quilts. Well, maybe we shouldn't call them quilts anymore. Maybe we should call them quilted textiles or, or something else because when you attach the word quilt to them, I don't tell people anymore that I'm a quilt collector because most of the time they say, why? <laughs> because there are quilts and then there are those that we have downstairs or those that we have in the gund. Uh, there's a difference. Women made utility quilts, quilts to be used. Another funny story, talking to a woman in Kansas. Kansas or Iowa. I don't know, I get those Midwest states mixed up. But <laughs> anyway, lovely, lovely old lady, elderly lady, you know, very starched, uh, dress, apron, fancy, handkerchief in, this, in her breast pocket, smelling of powder and a little bit of rouge, a little bit of hair just perfect. And Paul and I were talking to her because in this one quilt, quilt guild situation, there was a show of her work. And we got to talking with her. She made 250 some odd quilts in her lifetime. Most of them were gifts. Most of them were gone. Most of them she made for a daughter, uh, grandchildren, friends, or whatever, but there were about 10 or 12 of her quilts that were on exhibition. They were incredibly beautiful. 
beautiful craftsmanship, beautiful fabrics. And we, we, were, we got in a conversation with her, and she said to me, she said, quilts are like hankies. You know what a hanky is? OK. She says, some of them are for show, and some of them are for blow. <laughs> what you're looking at downstairs <laughs> is for show. Um, the marvelous thing about what's happened within my lifetime is that even quilts that were inherited by people who didn't have any interest in them didn't get used up. Now, many did. I mean, I've seen many, many quilts that were used by generations that inherited them who didn't respect them, didn't understand them, and didn't know that they were not ever meant to be used up. They were meant to be treasured, and they were meant to be handed down. But we're still so fortunate that for, one, for, for whatever reason, sometimes people inherited things that they couldn't use, didn't use, didn't want to use. The colors weren't fashionable, whatever. As I say, a lot of the orange quilts let, were, are around today because people didn't want to use them, because the color didn't go. You know, It didn't go with their decor. But thank God, they saved them, and they preserved them. And uh, so we have them in evidence today. The one thing that I think is really shocking people when they walk into the exhibit is the condition of the quilts. And that was one of Paul's and my uh, first priority, was that we did not collect things that weren't in absolutely perfect or excellent condition. It was going to take just as much time, energy, money, and space to protect things that were in good condition as it was things that were not in good condition. So we just said, it's someone else's job to take care of those. We're going to spend our energy and, and time on preserving those things that are in beautiful condition right now. We know so much more about how textiles need to be cared for. And as a result of that, textiles are going to last an awful lot longer, especially in institutions, because institutions are, are providing them with the, the correct kind of temperature control and the, and, the, and the correct kind of treatment. I wish you could see the way these quilts were handled from the time they left my home until they found their way on this museum's walls. Talk about respect. These were not handled by anybody except in white coats and white gloves. You know, I got a little scared because I thought they were coming after me. <laughs> But at any rate, these things have been so beautifully uh, handled here by only professionals. And one of the biggest compliments I got from the head curator, textile curator here, um, uh, Meredith, is she said she had never worked on tech quilts that were in such good condition. Well, that to me said everything, because it meant the last 50 years has meant something in terms of keeping these things in the condition that they're in. But um, I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent, and probably, yes. Thanks so much. Wonderful talk um, and very impressive collection, of course. Um, also, the G's Bend one from Alabama, which had come through the MFA a few years ago, was very impressive. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about how much of your collection you've bought from makers or family. and what it means to buy something that was made for a very personal use, like you said, um, in some cases, to protect their freezing children, or you know, uh, something that's just so much more personal than many other works of art can mm -hmm. be. Thanks. Yeah, I can address that. Unfortunately, by the time a quilt comes through a series of hands, and quilts since the 19 since we started collecting in 1969. Quilts are big business, and it's the decorator market that pretty much drives the quilt market. And as a result of that, dealers and other people who will collect things for people like me to see don't want to divulge their sources. And as a result of that, a great many of the things by the time they get into my hands or our hands we didn't know anything about. We, we feel very fortunate when we do, when we are able to find things that have a provenance, because it has a great deal to do more with, with the value, of course. Uh, signatures on quilts sometimes don't mean anything. Um, 
a signature in a quilt and a date in a quilt in the quilting means something because you can pretty much be guaranteed that that is going to be the owner, the maker. But many times what's on the back of quilts, for instance, either written or in separate things and attached, could be the owner of the quilt could, who it could have been made for. And dates don't mean anything on quilts either unless it's, they're supported by the actual fabrics that are in the quilt itself. So quilts pretty much tell you uh, when they were made just by your ability to, to look at fabrics and know when those particular fabrics were, were uh, created. But certainly when we get a quilt that has a provenance, yes, it makes a great deal of difference. But uh, it isn't often. Quilts traveled a lot too because they were so portable. And as a result of that, we, sometimes we don't even know the original location of them. Although with the last, um, in the last, starting in 1983, a fellow by the name of Bruce Mann, a fellow from Louisville, Kentucky, he was a quilt dealer, but he was also very conscientious. And he saw Kentucky quilts just leaving the state so rapidly because Kentucky had such a rich tradition of quilt making. Dealers were flooding into that state and just raping and pillaging, literally. And Bruce became so concerned that he started what was later followed by every single state in, this con in the Union, and that is quilt documentation projects. They're all volunteer efforts, and it was an attempt to, to, to find, to photograph, to identify, to document, and to keep records of quilts that are in individual, still in individual homes and hands. And as a result of that, that project has traveled throughout the country. There are very few states that haven't become involved uh, in that. Massachusetts has just finished theirs. And there's usually a, a major publication that comes out of all of these findings. And the whole idea was to create a database available to scholars, quilt historians, curators, museums, whoever, to create a database of all of that information that would be available. It hasn't been, it hasn't been done yet, but that was the, that was the initial um, reason for all those state projects to be done. Now, most of the states were done in states, but in states like Pennsylvania, where there was such a rich history of uh, quilt making, it had to be done by county by county. So, um, and I, I can't remember, I think it was, Paul and I were asked to do a project called Gatherings America's Quilt Heritage. And um, you remember what date that was? I can't. I think it's, uh, it was 1991, I believe. But anyway, we researched and went into every one of the state documentation projects and chose quilts that had interesting stories, that had um, human stories. And we created an exhibition that previewed at the National Quilt Museum in Paducah, Kentucky, and then traveled. But one of the, some of the interesting things that came out of that project was that there would be people, I remember I was in California at the time, working on the project there. I was talking to a friend of mine, Bettina Havig, who was working on the project in Missouri. I just said to her, we just documented a wonderful quilt coming from Missouri. Uh, the name of the people of the family were such and such. And she said, well, it seems to me we documented um, quilts from that same family. And that family was reunited at the gatherings uh, exhibit in Paducah, Kentucky, because it was through the quilt projects, because they had lost touch with one another, that they were actually that family. And there were like three or four instances in that particular case where families were reunited through quilts. Yes. And, um, for those of you on the right side of the auditorium, there's also a microphone over there. Is there something that today's quilter is doing or not doing that gives you concern for the future of the work that's being made today? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to touch that. Um, <laughs> quilts are made for very, very different reasons today than they were uh, in, the, in the 19th century. Um, by and large, quilts are made for competition today. And as a result of that, the, the appearance has changed considerably. Um, and a great deal uh, has happened with regards to 
um, the techniques. The techniques are so varied today because of what the, um, but the, what the machine is able to do. And people say to me, uh, do you like what's being done today? Well, of course, there is some of it. I'm a contemporary quilt maker. Um, so yes, I do like what's being done today, uh, but I dislike what's being done today as well. I don't like tortured cloth, for instance. You know what tortured cloth is? Well, we have machines today that will actually program and you could just run your quilt through it and it'll quilt it for you. It no longer stays within the boundaries of the seams like what happened when we were doing handwork and staying away from seam allowances. And as a result of that, the quilts today can be so stiff and so hard that you could scale them across a room <laughs> because the quilting is so dense. There's also a thought among conservators about what's going to happen to the, those quilts in the future. And the thought is that because the machine puts such an intense, strong stitch through a cotton cloth, that eventually that stitch is going to tear right through the cloth and there'll be, there'll be nothing but piles of, of fragments of cloth on the floor. However, quilting relates to every single group, every single group that comes along adds something to the, to the, the tradition. And it's going to continue. It's going to continue regardless because there's still the, the need to do it. And the need to do it is to use familiar tools, cloth, needles, thread, whatever. It's the idea that we love cloth, that we love the touch of cloth, we love everything about it, and as a result of it, that's what makes us comfortable in, in choosing a medium of self-expression. Does that answer it at all? There's a wide, wide variety of what's being done today, and uh, probably wider than there ever has been. But I think one of, the, one of the damaging parts of quilting is that it is such an enormous business today, money-wise. And sometimes money corrupts. Yes. Hi, I wondered if um, you knew, for instance, in the collection that you have, if they were made by a single individual or by groups? Oh, that's a good question. In most cases, the tops were made by single individuals. Where groups come into it is actually when the quilting is done. Many people, including myself, I'd much prefer to piece or to applique than quilt. So I will sometimes send a top away to be quilted. Now, I'm very particular about how I want my tops quilted. So I will send a cartoon, which is actually one quarter of the quilt drawn specifically where every bit of quilting goes. So in the 19th century, the women who would make their tops would then go to what was called a quilting bee and they'd bring their tops. And those tops would then be stretched on quilting frames and there'd be three ladies sitting on one side and three ladies sitting on the other. And as they worked, as they quilted, they quilted towards the center. As that section was completed, then the quilt was mounted on series two rollers. Then they would be advanced, and they would, they would complete. So they could be completed. One top could be completed in a much, much shorter period of time than uh, one person doing the quilting herself. But there's lots and lots of stories about quilting bees because it gave an opportunity for women to get together, too, and to talk about their husbands, to talk about recipes, to talk about child rearing or whatever. And there were often cases too where not everybody had the same level of skill, but that didn't mean you couldn't take part. It did mean, however, that probably the quilting that you did wasn't taken out and done again by someone who quilted better. So the, there were standards, but it's very difficult to tell when 
quilts are done by a group or when they're done by an individual, especially when the the groups in the in the uh, the individuals in the groups were still were had the same level of of expertise and craftsmanship. You have some beautiful quilts here, and I'm looking at the one presently, which has a beautiful border. I'm curious about the use of borders, and I noticed that the quilt with a lot of orange in it only had the border on three sides, and on the top, it's not continued. Just Would, it just designates the top of the quilt. Okay. Yeah, sometimes borders weren't put on the tops of the quilts because the, the um, quilt was made for a bed, and rather than quilts going up and over pillows, they usually went flat, and then pillows were put on top. Hi. Um, I was wondering, on a personal basis, you and Paul, were you always in agreement on the acquisition? <laughs> uh, also, um, do you um, have any history of quilt making in your family, for instance, your mother, grandmother? No. My aunt, my 95-year-old aunt the other day told me that she remembers people quilting uh, in our family. I don't remember it. I was born and brought up in Worcester, Mass. By the time I was born, there wasn't any quilting being done in the home anymore. But it was interesting that my aunt told me that she remembered it. So yes, it was done then. And no, Paul and I did not always agree. But we had an agreement that if we felt strongly about something, either one of us, that it got included in the, in the collection. In, in this collection, is there a favorite quilt of yours? Yes, the one I'm looking at at the moment. <laughs> no, there are no favorites. Hi. Um, I have a question about um, collection and the process of being a collector. Over the years, I assume your sources have changed, just as the quilting and quilt making and, as you alluded to, the industry has changed. And the process of, did you edit what you own? Mm -hmm. And if so, how and why? And how did that impact your overall collection? OK, the Big collection, question. actually, we were fortunate. Uh, in our ability to handle many, many hundreds, thousands of quilts, because we were quilt dealers to begin with. We were buying and selling. And we were buying to satisfy the industry uh, on the West Coast, which is primarily the decorator market or art consultants. We learned early on that art consultants loved quilts because per square foot, they could cover a much larger area for much little money by comparison to what a painting cost. Um, yes, we edited constantly. How we discovered we were collectors was there were more quilts at home that weren't for sale <laughs> than were in the galleries that were for sale. And yes, we edited constantly because we were learning constantly. And as we learned and as our taste changed, um, we did edit. And many of the things that we had initially put in the collection were deaccessioned de from the collection. And we did it often because um, we realized how difficult it was to take care of these things. And even though we did it often, it still didn't stop it from getting out of control. <laughs> and initially when this exhibit was proposed and I started dealing with um, the curators here, I pulled 371 quilts, and any one of those could have been in the exhibit. And as we refined the, 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 as we refined the direction that the exhibition was going in, and how it was being defined, and how we were going to present it, and of course it had to do with gallery space. Uh, the gallery space is incredible. The Gund has 10,000 square feet. And it's probably the most luxurious space you could ever possibly show quilts, because it also has the, the height that it takes in order to show these things. These are, these are big pieces, actually, when you stop and think that, uh, I love saying this, the quilts replaced John Singer Sargent. 
But the John Singer Sargent exhibit was, the space was created in a much more intimate manner because those things were so small by comparison. And the wonderful thing about the Gund is that all those walls can be removed. So all the walls are then created specifically on how you want to move people throughout that space. Um, so the luxury of having 10,000 square feet to show 58 quilts. Initially, we brought 71 down here from my home, but 58 of the number that are that is up. And even as we were installing, um, decisions had to be made because there are eight different groupings. Each group represents a specific color theory. So the space was created for those. But even as we worked with thumbnail versions of the quilts that we had selected, when you actually get those quilts up and get them next to one another, sometimes they don't get along. So we had to settle a lot of arguments. And so there were, there were two actually eliminated of the 60 that we had chosen when we came up with 58 quilts. And it was like putting a, a knife in my heart every time I found out we were going to have to eliminate one or the other. But um, uh, did that answer your question? OK. This will be our last question. Someone mentioned the G's Bend quilts. Um, do you have any? And could you talk about the technique that was used for those in comparison or like well, the ones that you have exhibited? They seemed, the G's Bend seemed primitive in a different way than the quilts that well, you Well, that, that's a good question because I think the G's Bend exhibit and this exhibit are, are there's a commonality here. And that is that you're looking at the collectors. You're looking at those people who selected specifically what you're, what you're looking at. Uh, the G's Bend quilts uh, don't necessarily, what you saw does not necessarily represent a cross section of what is being made in that area. What you saw were quilts that were selected by a specific eye that was trained more as an artist than anything else in choosing and, and deciding and electing which of those quilts you're going, you are going to see. So in very much the same way, uh, this exhibit represents the people who put the collection together and who screened a lot of stuff for you, who actually presented things specifically for a, for a particular reason. The G's Bend quilts represent a whole different type of quilt making, too, because in most cases, um, you don't find quilts that are being made of remnants of things left over. And yet, that, the economy of that area created those quilts as much as the quilt makers did themselves because they had to use what was available. Not only did they have to use what was available, they were not aware of traditional quilt making techniques. So they didn't cut up those things and put them back together. They pretty much used the, the cloth as it was found. Now again, not in, in every case. They did cut and use some traditional patterns. But they did it in a manner that was very, very different than what traditionally was done. And it was primarily because of you know, an isolated area and also because of the people who actually selected those things for, for us to see. That answer? OK. Thank you very much. You're welcome.